So welcome to everybody who is uh, joining us. It's great to have you here and uh, thanks for coming to our discussion, our keynote discussion about uh, Peter's book, Democracy for Sale, and what this has, the impact this has on, on, on the world that we want to see in terms of a public good and a public commons. I've got Alec from our board, who is going to also speak uh, today about his experiences and uh, in Poland, but also give observations about the seriousness of the topic that we're, we're going to investigate over the next hour. Just to say, we will be able to take questions in the chat. So if you have any questions, please, please put them down. How we're going to do this session is I'm going to um, invite Peter in a few moments to speak. And then after that, Alec, and then we'll take uh, questions. If there's some questions that come up, we might have some interaction in between. But it would be uh, great if people can start posting things when, when, when Peter's speaking. Just to give a wee bit of background to Peter, and I will, I will do a little plug for his book, which I have here, Democracy for Sale, which is a, a, an, an excellent read if anybody hasn't read it yet. But it's, uh, it really brings to, to the forefront about the challenges we're facing in terms of our democracy and the dark money that's involved in our democracy currently, and also what, what this means for all of us, for those of us that want uh, an open world, an open ecosystem to exist, the challenges that we face in terms of the challenges that are present and there and are impacting in the world that we're in today. So I know we've had a lot of discussion during summit about different things that we, we, we have done before and thinking about things. And maybe this is a, a kind of new space for some of us to kind of have a discussion. But I think with Peter's book being here and the timeliness of it all, and also the fact that, that, that Peter works with Open, Open Democracy, uh, an organization that we have uh, strong links with, we use CC licensing. So thank you, Open Democracy for that. But without much further ado, I'd like to hand to Peter and to, to thank him for his time today and over to you, Peter, and then on, on to Alex. So Peter, thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Catherine. And thanks so much for uh, inviting me to be a keynote presenter at this. And as you say, I'm, I'm the investigations editor at Open Democracy and Creative Commons is something that we are very familiar with and are very big supporters of. So it's great to have the opportunity to, to talk to an audience that's really engaged in that subject. So that, that's fantastic, thank you. And just like a little bit of housekeeping for, and I will, my book is primarily about UK politics. Um, for anyone who's familiar with accents from this, this kind of archipelago, um, I'm not uh, Brit British, I'm Irish, um, but I've lived in the UK for most of my life. But my book is primarily about British politics, but also it's about the kind of, the it does in some ways chart the rise of populism across the kind of Western world, shall we say, the like kind of uh, European states and also America. But I'm aware that some of the things I'm talking about have happened, are happening all over the world from kind of India to Brazil. So, you know, if, if I'm not there, I'm not an expert in these, but I'm not going to say that these, these are only things that happen in Britain, but a lot of the things I speak to will be kind of British, um, British kind of issues. And as you can tell, I think it's one of those books that's got one of those titles. I must confess the title was, was my publisher's idea and I think he, he got it quite well on it. Um, Whereas possibly my, I was finding a bit more kind of milk toast. He went, no, no, let's call it democracy for sale. And you can kind of get a sense, I think, from that, what, what the book is, is really all about. It's really about how politics in the 21st century, polit contemporary politics, can be bought and can be influenced in ways that we find really hard to see. In kind of, especially in the online space, the rise of online disinformation, misinformation. I look at things like lobbying and I look at the role of money in politics. But I just want to tell you quickly where this book started, because I'm, I'm a journalist, I'm an investigative journalist, I've been a journalist for over a decade, but I hadn't really expected to spend what's now almost three or four years researching and writing about how money gets into British politics and into, into European politics. But this, this whole book actually stems from about two days before the Brexit referendum, the Euro referendum where Britain held to vote to leave the European Union, which was in kind of June, it was, that was on the 23rd of June, 2016. And a couple of days beforehand, I was working as a reporter for the Irish Times, which is a kind of main, one of the main newspapers in Ireland. And my news editor is based in the UK. My news editor said to me, look, will, will you go to Sunderland, which is a small kind of a small city, about 80,000 people in the north, um, in the north uh, east of England. Will you go there and you do this thing that journalists do all the time, which is will you write a story about this vote from that place? It's a very common thing you might see in your newspapers. Journalists go far away and kind of, writes, talks to people, how are they feeling, what are they thinking, and, and kind of writes it up. 
So I was in Sunderland and I'd never been before. And it was quite, it was very, had a very interesting trip. Uh, they were very, very, very pro leaving the European Union, much more so than kind of polls had predicted, which I thought was fascinating. But the most interesting thing actually was nothing to do really with my direct reporting. I was getting ready, I was leaving Sunderland and I was standing at a train station and I picked up a copy of a, of a newspaper, this free newspaper called The Metro that exists in across uh, Britain. And I'm sure lots of other countries have these kind of quite cheap free newspapers, a lot of advertisements, but with some original content. And this newspaper, the big advert, which took up the whole front page, a wraparound advert, and it just said, take back control. And take back control was the slogan of the Leave campaign to leave for Britain to leave the European Union. And I kind of looked at the paper and I flipped it over and the back was the logo of a political party called the Democratic Unionist Party. And a little imprint that said this message has been paid for by the Democratic Unionist Party. So Democratic Unionist Party is a party from Northern Ireland, only exists in Northern Ireland. They're in favour of the union with the United with Great Britain. So it's kind of Northern Irish party. Don't run candidates, don't do anything outside of Northern Ireland. So that's very strange. What's a political party in Northern Ireland doing buying expensive adverts hundreds of miles away? And I kind of forgot about it. I kind of thought about it. And I did, I did the other thing that journalists do, which is I looked at it. I sent a tweet of a, a picture of it. And I just stuck it in my bag and got back, got on the train when it arrived and wrote my story for the next day's paper. But in the days and the weeks and the months that followed, especially after the big vote to leave the European Union, there's a huge vote in Sunderland. Over 60% of people voted to leave the European Union. I found myself wondering about this advert. What was going on with this advert? And... What I found out, I started basically, kind of, I was aware that Northern Ireland, in Northern Ireland, political donations were secret because of the legacy of the Troubles, the conflict in Northern Ireland, the 30 years of violence that claimed over 3,000 lives. And because there was this political violence, there was a, it was an assumption, which seems reasonable, that political donors would be secret because they could be targeted and killed. But this was 20 years after the end of the violence in Northern Ireland, this rule still existed. And so what happened was I basically started writing about this. I wrote with a colleague at Open Democracy. We did a big investigation into this money. We discovered that the Democratic Unionist Party had spent a huge amount of money, almost half a million pounds, which is a huge sum for British politics and a ginormous sum for Northern Irish politics. It's more than 10 times what the DUP had spent in the previous election campaign on, on their Brexit referendum. And... We've discovered lots and lots about this story. We discovered like where some of this money had come from. It had come from kind of all sorts of strange, uh, very strange kind of character using loopholes in British law. We still don't know where the sums of money itself came from. But that started me thinking about, well, what goes on in politics? How can you spend money secretly in politics? Like, how is this possible? How is it okay to spend money secretly? And I mean, well, maybe this is a one-off. Maybe this is just this one strange little thing where someone took advantage of this one-off loophole in Northern Irish law to spend this money. But the more I started looking at it, the more I found that actually there's loads and loads of loopholes in, in, in British law and lots of other laws too, but actually particularly in Britain, because Britain, like America, runs on private money. In lots of European states political parties are funded by the state. In Britain, it's private money. So actually, there's a huge incentive to deliver private money. But unlike America, actually, it's quite small amounts of private money. So in America, you'd have to spend, you know, tens of millions of pounds almost to get, you know, to get any kind of traction in American politics. In Britain, if you donate £50,000 a year, which is not a great sum of money to a very rich person, you can get four private meetings with the prime minister and leading cabinet ministers of which no records are kept and no lists are kept of who attended. So it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of place in which small amounts of money can make a difference. And I started doing a lot of research into this and I discovered lots of aspects of money that was spent during the Brexit referendum, but actually way more than that, I discovered and I still write about this all the time, just how easy it is to influence politics with quite small amounts of money and often how easy it is to anonymously fund money into politics. You can fund money from offshore bank accounts into politics. You can, um, there's huge opportunities in Britain to um, to spend money in to lobby as well. I, I've charted kind of the rise of what you might call think tanks of kind of corporately funded bodies who don't declare where their money comes from, where their donors come from. But whenever we find out about it, it is a corporation behind it, which are very good at kind of getting into the political process of influencing the political process, again, using quite small amounts of money.
And the other thing that I started looking at a lot when I started when I started doing this research was the rise of online disinformation and the way the internet, I think, has supercharged the role of money in politics. So back in the past, um, say in Britain, if you wanted to have political adverts, you, the only way to do it was, say, to take out an advert in a newspaper. And it would have to have that little logo that says paid for by somebody. There's no legislation at all when it comes to taking adverts out online. So you can take out adverts on Facebook or wherever else. But not only that, you don't have to be a political party to do that. So what's happened in Britain has been this huge rise of kind of like what are, co- what are called astroturf campaigns. So they're campaigns that look like they're grassroots campaigns. They look like they are of genuine concerns. Say it might be the, the pro-copyright co- lobby. They could take out adverts, but almost completely anonymously. You can just buy adverts on Facebook and there's supposed to be laws around this, but the laws really are very weak and they're never enforced. So there's a huge, because what's happened is the laws and legislation in Britain and lots of other states are are 20 years old, so they're out of date. The internet has really given a huge opportunity to uh, to supercharge campaigning. And one of the kind of things I write about a lot, and one of the things I think is really important in all of this is that It isn't the only reason why you've seen the rise of populism. And that's not my thesis. I'm not saying that the only reason people vote for Donald Trump is because they saw an advert on Facebook. But I think we all, it's very easy. A lot of people then, because of it, they also then, the opposite happens where you underestimate the role in which anonymous money and anonymous funding can change discourses, can change political conversations in quite radical ways. And my book focuses a lot on the Brexit referendum because it's a really good example of it. You know, Brexit, the, the idea of leaving the European Union was a minority sport. And I, I kind of charted in my book in British politics for a very long time, from like the kind of mid 80s on. It was something that only existed on the fringe of the Conservative Party. It was a kind of, you know, not something that many people were interested in. But there was a small group of kind of libertarians, of think tanks, of people like that, of and of funders. You know, it's really interesting. If you look at the amount of private money that was spent on the Brexit referendum, most of it did go into the Leave campaign. And most of it came from things like hedge funds. So you had small groups of people who were very interested in it, who had a kind of personal interest in it too. And they are, the capacity of this, these small amounts of money to make big, huge differences in politics is often massively uh, underplayed. And I will finish up in a sec, but what's been quite interesting as well is when I, I wrote this book, uh, it's a product of many years of research. I, I write about this sort of stuff as, as, as my day job. Um, and I finished it in January of this year, and it's supposed to come out in May, and it ended up being put back for a few months because of the coronavirus. And it came out in August. And when I was, before my book came out, I was expecting a lot of kind of some pushback from people who might say, look, there's some of the truth in this. Yes, it's too easy to get access to politics. If you give a you know, politician £10,000, they probably will ask a question. This happens all the time in Britain. They'll ask a question in Parliament for you. They might get wrapped over the knuckles, but nothing by, by the authorities, but nothing will happen to them. But it's not as big a deal as this. But actually, through the last few months in Britain, we've seen, and I've been involved and other colleagues of mine in writing about this a lot, and incredible levels of cronyism. You know, you've seen huge government contracts go out to politically connected firms for hundreds of millions of pounds, actually billions of pounds probably cumulatively to deal with the COVID crisis. We've seen government ministers. We had one incredible situation in which a government minister who's still in post, a housing minister, a man called Robert Jenrick, admitted apparent bias in reversing a housing de- a decision of to do with a property development, a major property development for a conservative donor that saved that donor £45 million. The minister admitted apparent bias and yet is still in post. This happened during the summer. We had the prime minister give his own brother a seat in the House of Lords, as well as a lot of Conservative Party funders and other people who were close to him, his former editor and his best mate, Evgeny Lebedev, who, who's, who's a major uh, newspaper owner too. And so we've seen I think kind of uh, the the reality of what this cronyism does and what corruption does in politics, both in terms of outcomes, you know, we, we it's quite palpable that Britain has had worse outcomes in this uh, coronavirus because of the way it is governed, and so this is the kind of the kind of almost like the outworking, I would argue, of a, a system that has been really bro- badly broken for a long time. But in classic fashion, um, and I don't think this is just a British thing, I think it's a case across the world, and Catherine has political experience, so she might wish to differ with me, but often politicians, no matter what stripe they are, have a, have a huge vested interest in not changing a system, even if the system is broken. Thanks. Thanks, Peter, for that. And I, I, I think there are still some politicians there who can still 
uh, try and change the system. But I think as you experience and what you've described is that the level of what is happening is, is quite, um, it's not just damaging, it's extraordinary. And I think what your book does is to highlight and to shine a light in dark spaces that it needs to be shown. And your continued work as an investigative journalist helps us to understand, not just in the UK, but in Europe and the rest of the world, the, the, the global challenge that we face. And we need, and that's why the importance of a good investigative journalism is absolutely necessary to hold truth to power. But I'm going to hand to Alec just now, and I'm just conscious, please put things in the chat for questions, because I think this is really important. Alec, over to you and your thoughts and ideas about this discussion. It'd be great to hear. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm joining this conversation from Warsaw, Poland. And I want to start by saying that uh, usually I don't speak about politics. Um, I see my work as focusing on, let's call it, politics of the web, and I'm aware that to intersect, but sort of that's not my piece of cake. Um, I'm not a political activist in Poland, though my organization at key moments of a civic debate, we do take stance even on issues that fall sort of beyond our statute, which largely has to do with issues around openness, digital uh, rights and so on. So I have this mild position, but I thought since you ask, I will speak a bit about politics and democracy and um, well, I, if I was to spoil what I want to say, basically, I am here to confirm that this is not just a UK uh, issue, right? That I think we're facing the same challenges across the world. Um, today in Poland and over the last years, basic civic rights have been uh, either endangered or have already been curtailed. Today, um, uh, the uh, Constitutional Tribunal has further limited uh, reproductive rights of women, which already are one of the most, uh, we have one of the least, least liberal, if not the least liberal law in the European Union. So it's actually a quite tough day. Um, at the same time, we have a civically backed um, civic rights ombudsman who she's not being chosen by the parliament for purely political reason without any taking into balance of her sort of work um, as a civic ombudsman, which is a non-political position. Uh, I could go on and on. I don't have too much to say about the funding part of politics, which I find your analysis extremely important, largely because I think these analyses are uh, not fully made in Poland. Um, similarly with disinformation, we all have a sense that we basically function in the same environment that both political and technological, which together combined uh, sort of uh, gives rise to disinformation, misinformation, but actually we're a country that despite being in a pretty tough geopolitical location, right, we're on the border with Russia, on the border with Belarus, uh, in, in a region of, of Europe and the world, which is often not thought that way, but, you know, conflict is not really far from us. Um, we, we, we failed to do these basic analysis, so I can only appreciate the work, uh, Peter, you're doing um, in the UK. Um, I, I, I found really important what you said. Disinformation is for me a crucial issue. I, for instance, we just had presidential elections in Poland and I was dismayed that across the political spectrum, not one candidate flagged it as a, as a, as a, as a key issue to deal with. I think one could say digital issues are difficult, you know, they're not the sort of typical uh, understandable issue. And we know that politics, in presidential politics, simple messaging. But when you think about it, I think it becomes pretty clear that all forms of disinformation and be it both, you know, geopolitical, be it political at national level, but also even challenges around hate, you know, at the level of personal lives, I think it, 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 um, it uh, it affects us all. Um, one thing I want, want to highlight is that uh, another thing, I think one of the big challenges I'd like to put forward as well is that our public spheres begin, begins to splinter. I'm a big fan of the term open used not only in relation to content, but also societies. I do believe in the vision of an open society. And um, I'm more and more 
believe that in fact that that's no longer a diagnosis of where we are there's a work done by i think he's a psychologist jonathan Haidt, who writes about different moral systems and he basically says that there's a liberal moral system and a traditional or conservative and they're like two moral universes it's really hard to find connection they're just simply based on very different values and if that um, diagnosis is true and in Poland and in the UK and name any country you want here that's represented in this room. We actually have splintered, not one society, but some splintered configuration of very different communities. That's for me personally very hard. And now I think uh, if I may add a perspective coming from also a person involved with Creative Commons very long, I think the big question is how does that connect and does it connect? Um, and I think in, in general, and I hope we can discuss this a bit further, we need to, I believe that we need to pay attention to this, though I don't know how much. And the reason we need to pay attention is that at least since I think probably Cambridge Analytica, but maybe you can place the, 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 the time marker at some other point, it's clear that the politics of the web, the, the structure of the web, uh, the basic sort of infrastructural characteristics of it affect politics as such, affect democracy as such, affect civic life and the public sphere as such. I know these are big terms. And uh, I must say, not ones we discuss that often uh, in our community. And I'm very happy, Catherine, by the way, that you're uh, raising this topic through this conversation. Um, so I hope we can talk a bit more. What's our responsibility here? Um, I just want to um, finish my, my introductory sort of statement with an anecdote, if I still have time. Catherine, yeah. So, and um, this has to do with Lawrence Lessig's Free Culture. This is a Polish version of it. For me, this was a foundational book. You know, it, it really one of these titles that changed my life, I can say. I imagine for people uh, who are, <laughs> younger uh, and joined this movement later, not necessarily so, uh, but this is sort of my uh, important uh, piece of my uh, biography. And this book has a, a unique, I think, introduction, which is an introduction which Larry wrote for the Polish edition. And it's important to note that Larry, before he started working on copyright issues, was a constitutional lawyer with a particular interest in communist constitutions. And he did understand very well Poland under communism and the revolution of 89. So he wrote an introduction where basically he compares the free culture movement and creative commons to the Polish solidarity movement, which in the 80s was this fundamental movement that brought together workers, intellectuals, basically people of all sorts in a civic movement that over the long term, it took around 10 years, basically led to a nonviolent revolution that made Poland democratic. So that's a very strong comparison and and Larry writes in in this introduction that the fight that that the free culture movement is fighting for values that solidarity would support you know big words uh, but I think he was right to say so because he was basically speaking about liberty and now here's the catch I think it's either in free culture or another book that's by now 20 years old old which is Larry's code and other lows of cyberspace when he thinks about what's the challenge to liberty, he says it's the uh, uh, technical protection measures that stop you from copying a CD. And I think that sounds so anachronistic, some might even laugh, you know? I think we shouldn't laugh. 20 years ago, that was really the big issue around control, personal liberty and freedom. But by now, we moved so much on. I think, Peter, you don't worry in your book that there's some big democratic challenge to copying culture, right? And so for me, this is the question. I think I, I wouldn't laugh at this comparison that, that, it, that the values are the same, but clearly the stakes have changed. And I think this is the big question for us. Uh, to what extent we can do this work? As a movement, you know, that has specific tools. I assume uh, we will not suddenly shift to being, for instance, a freedom of speech organization, but I hope we can talk a bit what's the work to be done by us. Thank you. Thanks, Alec, and thanks, Peter, as well. Now, we've got some good questions in the chat, and I think that's an important moment to bring those in, if that's OK, Alec. We've got Matthew, who's asked about, I wonder what the panel makes of some of the US literature on dark money and politics, um, uh, including the work of, of, of Larry. 
And then Ben McCaskill's asked an interesting question. I think this is more to you, Peter, about is there an ethical way in this money driven political environment for business to influence direction in politics? Your copyright reform, for instance, can be driven heavily by giant industry, and these reforms have catastrophic impacts. On, um, on 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 our business, but we haven't tried to pour money into politics to combat that. It feels unethical to buy our protections. I think this is a a really interesting point. And then Matthew's gone on actually to talk about dark money, both in US but also in Australian politics. There's more coming. There's more um, points coming up as well. But I think that's the first few questions we have. What what do you think, Peter? Is there an ethical way that we can? Do business and politics. Challenge. I, it's, it's interesting, actually. Even just you know, since we spoke about having this session um, yeah. in the last few days, I had been going through some transparency data uh, from the House of Commons for a story I'm working on, and I noticed that um, kind of pro copy. Because it, it's interesting because this isn't an issue. You know, copy copyright is something I'm interested in, but it's not something that's front and center of my work. But I noticed like kind of pro copyright organizations funding things in the House of Commons and stuff. And you can see, you know, and I didn't notice creative the Creative Commons movement in there. So you can do this opera. And often like that is the reality. Like businesses will take opportunities to to get involved in the political process in ways that actually I think sometimes like large corporations will in ways that actually even smaller smaller businesses or more ethically driven businesses won't even know that exist if I'm being honest. Often they won't even know that there's opportunities, say, to sponsor a lunch in the House of Lords or something. And that can be a really, really useful way. Like it's not, it's very untransparent. Whoever turns up, there's no minutes kept. You know, it's and I, I think that's the way often how politics how money and linkages work in politics it's it's a way of you know there's a tendency to imagine that everything is driven by huge sums of money given say as backhanders to politicians but actually often the system is much more um in some ways much more weighted very differently and i, I think much harder to change because it's it's about connections it's about networks and i think there, there's definitely the case that industry and jane meyer um to bring in uh, matthew's question uh, develops this so well in her book Dark Money about the rise of the Koch brothers and the kind of libertarian movement from the 1970s on in America. And what you're talking is, what the Koch brothers did was and they spent billions was they basically, they very cleverly bought up the idea space. And this is what corporations do in general. It's less about trying to buy politics and buy politicians. It's about buying the ideas that the they politicians produce or talk about politicians rarely have huge ideas themselves you know like in terms of like this is this driving thing i need to do they they are quite in some respects quite malleable in the nicest possible sense and if you are able to get to them and lobby them there's huge opportunities to to produce change and what the coke putters did was they barely gave any money the coke putters have rarely given that much money to the republican party what they've done is spent all their money on kind of fake think tanks research institutes and lobby groups and academics, um, what's called the kind of white coat strategy. We're actually seeing it around COVID. What you do is you get academics to, you know, t take heterodox views. You create a narrative in the media that, has bun that the academic, uh, the, that the scientists are split on this issue. Um, as we've seen with climate change. And it's a very, very effective strategy. And I think there's a huge challenge for um, ethical businesses to try and an ethical, um, an ethical kind of organizations to try and engage with the political process in a way that that is transparent and kind of keeps their values, but doesn't that uh, um, that manages to um, to kind of keep pace with this. I think the one thing I would say is that I'm very wary of like say mimicking the political strategies of the populist right when it comes to things like misinformation, when it comes to things like Facebook, when it comes to things like, you know, just doing the same things that I think all they end up doing is degrading trust in the political process. And I'm very conscious of that in my own work too, actually. I meet loads of good politicians of from different parties. Like, and I think there's a real danger of of damaging trust in politics writ large. But the, for someone like me, there is an issue where we have got a crisis of trust in politics. And I think, if we were to solve some of these issues and be seen to solve them, it would help. But when it comes to things like, you know, engaging with politicians, I think it is important, actually, that ethical businesses do that. And I don't think there's a problem with that. If that is what the system, how the system is set up as is, when it comes to actual engagement, I think actually it is important to figure out, well, how are the ways that we as an ethical business can, can engage? Because, you know, if the big banks, for example, are able to spend a fortune on lobbyists and all the rest of it, you might be able to do that. But what can the not-for-profit sector, what can um, ethical banking do to actually engage? You know, is there people 
is there champions that you can have within a parliamentary system that you can engage with and talk to that might be able to help you? Because I think there is a need to put the other side of on in that sort of way. I think that's actually where I've less of an issue because if the system does, you know, lobbying, the, my huge issue with lobbying is transparency and lack thereof. There will always be some form of lobbying because that's the nature of humanity. The, and I think there's a way, there's a need for ethical businesses to think about, well, how can we do that in an ethical way? Yeah. And good lobbying registers and transparency. Yeah. So they can be held accountable. Alec, do you have something to add to that? Yes, I in, I want to thank, I think it was Matthew uh, who brought into this conversation this issue of the influence of money sort of in, in, in our network, in, in our line of work, because indeed that's an, that's an important topic. I think it's, it's slightly different from the general conversation about the influence of money, but certainly it's important to acknowledge that we've been facing these issues, right? Yeah. Um, it's, it's a challenge uh, where, um, so I want to highlight several issues. I think maybe I should start by saying that as an organization, I have my own organization alongside running the Polish chapter of Creative Commons, which is not an organization. I have a Think and Do Tank, which has been active for 10 years. And the reality of running such an organization, which a lot of you can appreciate, is that we are cash strapped. And we're basically, there's this term in Poland, grantosis, which is the situation where you have a grand vision and you'd love to pursue it. Uh, but you're pursuing grant goals because you uh, the the funding the philanthropic funding is not strong enough to give you you know the advantage of just purely uh, setting your sight on on the biggest goal um, and and I I don't think I don't want to treat that as an excuse uh, and I think the main goal is being very sort of self-aware and reflective about where your funding comes from and for instance. One of the rules we had, but it's also a rule that easily can be questioned, is that we felt that we can't take corporate money on non, um, non-activist, non-advocacy work, for instance, on educational programs. And I think you need to judge yourself whether you feel that's a fair sort of uh, balance or whether money always corrupts. And that's not something you can do even if you split between, uh, you know, you draw some line internally. But I want to be honest about it, you know, this is happening. Um, I think a lot of research that we depend on, uh, very good research, sometimes is corporately funded, right? Uh, the big copyright directive had such research coming from all sorts of places. And I'm not speaking here, um, Peter, you talk about think tanks, right? And in that case, it's very clear, this is research for hire. But more interesting is the case of academics, which I think, again, I, I trust their integrity, but their programs, their projects, their specific papers or whole institutions sometimes are funded with corporate money. And I think it's a, it's a really big, big question. And the only answer I can provide is that it's a blessing to have uh, independent funding. And for me, there's no stronger way to do it than crowdsource. Uh, I think this is uh, an ex ex extreme advantage of Wikimedia, for instance, which can run, uh, you know, totally unencumbered uh, advocacy work, e extremely clear on its purpose because, okay, I know they have some small grants that are corporate, but in principle, right? And I think if they wanted to, they'd probably be able really to remove them. Uh, this is sort of from the community, it's civically funded. And I think that's a very important principle if we had uh, I really believe that, um, you know, civic funding is the way to go in terms of stre strengthening civil society. We need a lot more of that. In Poland, I can see a, from year to year a shift where a lot more people, uh, one Polish activist called it a subscription for democracy. You know, you subscribe to Netflix, you subscribe to The Guardian. Why don't you subscribe to democracy and pay a monthly amount? I think that's a very strong metaphor we should explore both to fin fund, you know, big level political work and activism, but also the kind of work we do. I, I, I'm just going to say about investigative journalism, though, as well, Alec, as being part of our democracy and how, you know, how challenging it is in terms of journalists just now in terms of funding as well to hold those in power to account. And I know that, you know, the funding models of our press have, have changed dramatically. I don't know if you want to, I, I see a question come up for Alex, but I don't know if you want to add something to that. Peter. In terms of yeah, in terms of media, I think it's it's a this is a huge challenge. You know, my career, if you even just look at someone like me, like I worked in 
for profit media, put it like that, for, for years, for over a decade. Now I work in what could be called the non for not for profit sector. So open democracy is supported by uh, subscribers who give us money and donors. And a big difference, I think, and it, it's my one of my big things with this is so with open democracy, we do publish on our website details and financial breakdowns of all of our money and a lot of the kind of people I write about don't and that's a huge thing I think it's a really to me it's a big red flag as well because you're like well why will you not tell us where your money comes from but there's a huge challenge when it comes to um when it comes to uh, invest the type, type of journalism I do and investigative journalism in general and just journalism in general because the old ad revenue model of journalism is broken and what we've seen is Facebook and Google in particular have harvest, harvested all that money, basically. You know, a lot of content is produced by journalists that's well read, but the overarching, you know, 70, 80, 90 percent of the advertising spend against that is go, goes to Facebook and Google. And that is a huge, huge problem. Um, and that's, you know, it's not the only problem that exists within the industry, but it's, it is probably, I think, the biggest problem that exists within the industry. So you end up with this lopsided, um, my, and my big concern is that you end up with a lopsided uh, system where there's a lot of there's a lot of good journalism being produced. And in many ways, I think this, you could argue there's never been as much good journalism produced, but often now it's having to go behind paywalls to try and uh, sustain itself. And it means I think a lot of people aren't actually consuming good journalism. I'm really struck with people I know who who... I would have thought would have been able to, you know, kind of parse the difference between quality journalism and and journalism that's not trustworthy. But often because, and I think part of the problem is that so much of it's going behind a paywall. Huge amounts of of really good journalism is now behind a paywall. So people are kind of just getting their news from whatever comes across them. And I think, and that's aided by by tech companies and as the models within it. So I think there's a huge there's a huge democratic issue that goes behind uh, the kind of the la- the kind of. Pr- well, it probably is a crisis in journalism. Um, I read recently, this was new news to me, Peter, you probably have heard about this long ago, about how uh, this was a case of the US, how local newspapers mm-hmm. are being shut down and replaced by these very sleek, algorithmic, basically news outlets, online ones. And there's even now an arms race because I understand that in the response to a network of right wing, uh, these outlets uh there's now a liberal uh venture capital fund connected to some foundation to some media company that tries to roll out their equivalent and as you said this is interesting you said we shouldn't be following the right uh wing tactic of these disinformation methods these people decided that's the way to go so you know clickbait um uh data analytics micro targeting you name it i think that what i see there the challenge, and again, I, I know how to frame it. I still don't know how much it's our job to worry about it. You know, they do remixing, they use open data. Uh, they're like a pretty good, if you look at just like this free culture ideal and put aside the externalities that have to do with this information, they're like a pretty good commoner, <laughs> I'm afraid. <laughs> They'd probably be happy to freely share it because honestly, that's not their business model to sh- sell these articles. A lot of them are written automatically. And, and, and this is what I want to hint again. I think we do have some responsibility. And the copyright answer is this is not a copyright issue. That's true. But the externalities, I'm afraid, you know, they're piling up. Um, and we need to start dealing with them. That there are some interesting, I think, conversations yeah. we're having at this summit, by the way, uh, a series of talks around data and AI that hint at, at uh, a shared understanding that this is an issue and how to solve it. Yeah, yeah. The power of lobbying and the power of presence is something which um, you touched upon, Peter. I certainly experienced it my five years work in copyright yeah. reform in the EU, where the opposition to our perspective had three three words, the value gap, and used it for five years. And before we could even be heard, that was taken as read. And, and it was just the disproportionate uh, investment of, of, of presence was, I mean, Alec, you were there as well. <laughs> That's how I got to know and you. There's a, interestingly, I'm confirming your th- thesis very well. There's a slide deck that's sort of the source of it all, you know, like the patient zero of this uh, framing. Yeah. It's there, you know. It's a, it's a, it's a very good. It's, it's not disinformation. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's a solid analytically, but presenting obviously a certain spin that I imagine was 
relatively not that expensive to produce. I think your your analysis of how it works fits very well to that yeah. copyright yeah. debate. Yeah, I think we need our own three words. They had deep take back control, the value gap. <laughs> anyway, I see questions from Matthew. Um, another question to you, Alec, about what do you what what do you make of the use of defamation actions in Polish politics? And Heidi has come in and said about the conversation happening in museums and cultural heritage institutions about funding sources. I think that's a really important point and observation too. So we'll go to Alec with that first question and then maybe just have a thought about what funding more generally of our, our, our public good, our open space. The first question, I must admit that's a bit hard for me to comment. Uh, okay. Yes, Polish government has this strategy, I think not a very successful one of uh, trying to show that it has as the title says this long arm that reaches globally. Um, I, I, fortunately, I think that doesn't work very well. I think it's not very smart also diplomacy and I would leave it at that. I'm, I'm more interested by the other question because this issue of, of reliance on private funding, I said a bit about crowdfunding, but as coming from Europe, I should add, I also very much believe in public, in public interest uh, and role potential of public institutions. And maybe I should start by saying the word public is a bit different than the word state because state control that's the big challenge when we talk for instance about regulation but um i think when i say public i mean less control and regulation but more sort of, for instance setting up of infrastructure so museums that's a good example a cash strapped museum in poland will not invest money uh, in its own infrastructure but will very gladly sign a contract with google i think it's now called arts and culture which by the way it, it's a it's a very nice service it it I wish it, it more uh, applied principles of open and had a better, for instance, um, presentation of public domain. But in general, it's really cool. But the only problem of it is it makes these institutions reliant on a service. And I think we see this even more now in the pandemic. I, I met, uh, remember listening to this podcast by a um, uh, Belgian, she's actually Turkish, living in Belgium, uh, computer engineer, software engineer called Seyde Gurkis. And she says that it's a it's a shame that all these universities basically immediately purchased corporate uh, accounts on Zoom or WebEx or whatever other teleconferencing system you want, instead of making for themselves this challenge of setting up European public teleconferencing infrastructure because we all now need it, right? And and I I, I think that's a very well made point. I heard it like it's, it's probably has been made by many people. For me, say there was the the first one who made it and I keep seeing it, you know, with, with each sort of, with the current wave, uh, I feel we've kind of lost the half year when maybe some really smart group of engineers and funders and university administrators could have had this running, you know. Yeah, there, there's a question come in for you, Peter, but how many years do you think it will take for people as a society to understand the manipulation schemes and become resistant to it? That's a, I, I'm not sure if I could put a put a year or figure out. I do think it's really important to start doing this. Like as I say, like one of the reasons I think I became sort of kind of became so engaged in doing this work was that I've been a journalist. I've written lots of politics over the years. I've written books before, and this was a world that in some ways I fell into and started asking questions about. So I think it's actually because you know, in a, in a funny way, even I would have a lot of friends who are political journalists in London, in Westminster, what are called lobby correspondents. And when I started doing this work, a lot of them were just saying to me, why, do you, why are you bothering with this? It's not very interesting. You know, like, if this happens, who cares? And I think slowly that has changed. I think that that, that mentality is changing. So I guess part of what I hope is that by the work I do, people will pick it up and run it and do other things with it. People will start to learn a bit more about uh, how this is happening. And, and ultimately, I guess in some ways, you'd hope that in, it hasn't happened yet, but that uh, politicians will see that there's almost a tax on, you know, on manipulating voters. There's a tax, you know, there's a kind of electoral tax to be paid. And as I say, unfortunately, it hasn't happened yet. We had a very dirty British general election in December in which there was all kinds of online uh, malfeasance. You know, the, the ruling party, the Conservatives, rebranded their Twitter account as a fact check account during a live debate and then doubled down on it and said they'd do it again. You know, they... Uh, you know, uh, they what, what's called shit posting basically on the internet, where you just post stuff that's clearly nonsense uh, intentionally. So you know, they made a fake Labour manifesto, paid paid for Google advertisements. So if you t if you uh, 
t- typed into Google Labour Manifesto, the first thing that came up was this fake manifesto that was full of nonsense. You know, that kind of stuff, which is very undermining of democracy, and it, they didn't pay a tax for it. And that's my concern at the moment is that there hasn't really been a tax to be paid by people uh, so far. But I'm hoping that... Um, as people start to understand this more, people start to understand how they're manipulated and how easy it is to be manipulated. And they all, the big tech companies are a huge part of this. you know. And I think in, in a lot of states, Britain's not the only one, we've kind of outsourced regulation our democracy to tech companies. Yeah. You know, it's become what does a tech company want to do? And I remember when Facebook announced their ad library about two years ago, it was like this amazing thing. And people go, oh, this is great. Facebook are going to have an ad library of political adverts. You know, with, Surely the state should, that, that's the state's role. It should be, we should take, you know, the government, the public should have some out say in this. It shouldn't be just down to what Facebook will allow to happen or not allow to happen. And I think that's a huge, that's the biggest problem, if you ask me. Yeah. Yeah. I think in your book, you talk a lot about the failure of the laws around elections and how we're still, we're, our election laws in the analog world and it's not fit for purpose for the world we're existing within and those gaps need to be addressed and even when people have broken the law they're fined after the time the events happened and it's it's, it's, it's tiny amounts of money as well it's not it's what if you talk to politicians it's what the, they say it's the cost of doing business you know a fine for breaking political electoral laws just it's the maximum in britain is twenty thousand pounds which is not that much money in britain at all for like you know for parties that take in 40, 50 million pounds a year. It's just not, it's a, it's a drop in the ocean. It's a bit the same like the fines that tech companies get. So the highest fine ever for, uh, uh, until recently, until they changed it, the, the, previously the highest fine for uh, for a tech company in Britain around politics was, was Facebook got fined half a million pounds, which for Facebook is, you know, Facebook wouldn't get out of bed for 10 times that, never mind worry about a half a million pound fine. Mm-hmm. Alec, do you have anything else to add to that? I just want to say I'm, I'm a bit surprised, you know, and I'm counting on seeing at least in one country some kind of moratorium on disinformation. You know, you yeah. think that at some point the outcome of an arms race that you do game theory and you calculate your costs and you reach disarmament or moratorium. Um, I'm always heartened when I think about challenges like that. There's this podcast, an episode of the 99% Invisible podcast, which is a very good podcast about design on fire emergency measures in the past. And I think somewhere around 18th or 19th century, state of the art was a wicker basket connected to a winch at the top of a building on which, through which you could lower babies. So at least they survived. And the moral of the story is we went a long way, right? And we have the famous uh, staircases outside of buildings in New York and everyone can run down and we have fire extinguishers. And that's the metaphor would say, we just need to wait a bit and uh, ideas about public safety, public health, public interest will kick in. Um, that's sort of the optimistic maybe um, perspective, I would hope though. Though I also think when, when you say about tech companies, I always see a challenge, I'm in, in favor of state regulation. And again, I think that's a very, the thing that Europe is trying to bring into the tech debate. We're seeing more and more data a very American approach, very deeply rooted in this American idea, what it means to recklessly experiment, right? Um, uh, it, it, it sort of worked for this nation, uh, but there are also other traditions. So I think that this idea of regulation is important, but I keep thinking, you know, I think there's a very large chance these these companies will remain important actors. You know, we can curb their power, but I'm really interested in ideas Sometimes they're called platform constitutionalism. I think these are like long-term ideas um, uh, that that these companies have huge work to do to answer the question, what's their responsibility? And I know, you know, it's very, I find it fascinating to observe, for instance, the, uh, the Facebook oversight board, a lot of debate there, a lot of criticism. Some people say there's something interesting happening there, but I at least think we should be following these developments alongside regulatory talks. Uh, because I think in the long term, they need to also answer some questions about their responsibility. I remember when um, it was Jenny Gebhardt from the Electronic Frontiers Foundation, we shared a panel at IFLA last year, and she was describing this micro advertising and, the, and, and as, you know, it, it might be the best advertising, but how she described it was, you know, lead paint was the best paint in the world 
that it's toxic and we banned it. Micro advertising, probably the best advertising you could possibly have in the world, but it's toxic. And I thought that was a really good analogy of, uh, of, of what we're facing. Um, she knows I, I use her quote from time to time, so I just wanted to credit her, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's an important point. I think we've got a few questions. I'll come back to Emilio about the, the stuff I was saying before, but I think is the panel heartened by this week's American DOJ prosecution of Google? That's one question. It's an antitrust case. Yeah. And it'll be interesting to see what happens. Like, I think even Facebook's moves in the last months suggest that they think Joe Biden, that Zuck, Mark Zuckerberg, it does feel like Facebook are changing a bit because they are worried about what a new administration might mean, even though I don't, I'm not, you know, I'm not off enough with the, the mechanics of, um, of, of American politics to find out, you know, what, what would be possible. But it does sound as if, um, you know, if you look at the changes Facebook have already talked about, the stuff of QAnon, like closing down the QAnon sites, I think was really interesting as well. It suggests that, you know, and Facebook are very, Mark Zuckerberg is in particular, they're very, very, um, they change based on what's happening. So I think that's, that is quite, it's quite an interesting development. And I think clearly, you know, I, the reporting I've heard of the antitrust case with Google does suggest, if you look back, I, I mentioned it briefly in my book, if you go back to the end, the word antitrust comes from the trusts of the 19th century, you know, the, the rock, you know, the, the great big um, kind of robber barons of American, uh, of the kind of the 19th century of American, um, the railroad who owned the railroad and had these huge trusts that were huge, huge, um, you know, conglomerates and monopolies. And the antitrust movement came out of that and it took decades, but eventually they did break up the trust and that's where antitrust law comes from. And there is a history of doing that in America. And I think it is interesting to hear these people talked about um, Facebook and Google and Amazon and others in that way. And this, I think there's a kind of, it, it's not a bad analogy because if you think about it, these, the, the kind of 19th century um, huge oligarchs and plutocrats had kind of come to what was, you know, they they were they they made their fortune by just being there at a time when it was kind of empty. They got rid of the you know this without going to history of America America, but like there was huge money to be made without doing very much. And the big huge tech companies, unsurprisingly, are the companies that started twenty years ago when the internet started, which suggests that monopolies were based on just being there first, rather than being particularly amazing at what you were doing. Thank you. I guess it's also links to some of the debate we've been having during this summer about pub, uh, you know digital public infrastructure and and public spaces online and 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 how we break down wall gardens and all of that too and that's something which I think is important um, as we think about our future as well. Sorry, Alec, you were coming in there. I just want to say it's sort of a side note, but important because this is a global conversation. I keep thinking in such situations that there is an advantaged policy debate and it's the American one. Nothing new in a way, right? I will keep on sort of playing up this European angle, which is really important for me. I think there is a sort of looking at the big picture. There's a big challenge that now Europe is undertaking to demonstrate whether it can actually shape globally uh, digital policy, right? It started with GDPR. It's like and the brand is almost as recognizable as Coca-Cola. <laughs> Maybe not yet, but soon. Uh, but it's just the first step. And I think this is important because honestly, the Polish perspective is a bit frustrating. Uh, outcomes of our elections don't determine Facebook policy, right? Uh, we, we don't have the ear of Mark Zuckerberg um, unless there are some geopolitics playing out in Poland is some minor but important alley for the U.S., I'm saying this more from an even personal perspective. It sometimes um, leads to maybe some frustration or disenchantment with what you can achieve as an activist in your own uh, policy arena, an activist arena, which you'd like to think is important, but in this setup sometimes feels uh, not so much. You can have, I think, great ideas. You can have important conversations, but they're happening at the wrong place. Uh, and I assume this might be something that, that a lot of people in our community have a sense of as well. Yeah, there's a number of questions that have come in um, while you've been speaking. I, I know we've just got about six minutes left, but um, one of the things is from Paul saying there's serious doubts of targeted advertising is actually effective at all. I guess I'd, I'd come back and say, then why are so much money invested in it? Um, but also just the fact that at the moment, the electoral rules mean a, a can of deodorant has more rules applied to in terms of trade of standards than a political advert. 
and that's something that I think is <laughs> is that right you know is that the world that we want to live in um and I think the other point came in about monopoly do we need an anti-monopoly movement in intellectual property law and policy and should the creative commons ta tackle the tragedy of the anti-commons that's a good point as well so I guess we've got five minutes left before we have to wind up Paul Alec any thoughts on the last, que last question, I would say that's a big challenge for our activism yeah. that suddenly we need to deal with antitrust law, competition law, you know, this has not been sort of our focus. This is so very different from the diagnosis we've been following in our thinking. Um, so I, I just want to, without having a good answer, just uh, highlight the fact how challenging it is to pivot so much, you know, and I see this happening and for instance, Edri is doing very good work, but I think it's, it's a European digital rights initiative, I should mention, suddenly dealing with competition law, but, but just the last thing I want to say, uh, I've been hinting that I'm not sure yet what the solution is, I think it has to do some, with something to do with caring for the public sphere. Yeah. Um, I think that's what we should focus on. I think the project we should all be looking at more and, and sort of building connections with and supporting is Wikimedia. That's the online space that functions relatively normally in all this craziness. It's not perfect, it has its challenges, but it's, uh, I think, a lot better and misses all these issues. Like, you know, for sure there's no advertising there. And mm. probably that's a topic for a longer conversation, but I would leave you with this idea. Go over to you, Peter. Yeah, I would agree. I think, I think you know, from like, kind of touching on what you know I've, I've said my piece about what i think is important when it comes to money in politics but i think i think the public sphere you know as a journalist the public sphere is something that's really really important and i think having some form of shared public sphere and you know i talked there about having so much quality journalism behind paywalls i think you know finding ways to take that out finding ways to kind of bring that into the public realm so there is you know, a sense in which you can have a public conversation because I think more and more that's why we have seen the disintegration and the splitting and it kind of speaks to that whole thing of disinformation and, and even whether or not target advertisement works it's quite clear you know to the extent it does it's quite clear that it is incredibly easy for advertisers it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be politics or advertising it can be anything it's very easy to segregate populations into uh, into niches and cohorts and you can do it in Facebook in two minutes and I think that segmentation of society into discrete units into discrete cohorts has fed into this atomization the sense that there's huge polarization and i think anything that brings the public realm together in some you know some sort of habermasian way i think that's a really important i think it's a place where a kind of a, a kind of movement like creative commons would want to be thank you now we're down to two more minutes um Maybe I could just let the panel have the final words because we've got two more two minutes left. I must say that I feel that I managed to mention Wikimedia at least at the end. That Peter, you mentioned Habermas. There's not much more to <laughs> add. I can plug my book some more if you want. <laughs> well, you should at least show the cover. You know, it's a, it's also a very pretty cover. Why don't we do that? <laughs> He's got a copy there. I've got one too. So look, I just want to say we're now down to kind of a minute before we have to finish. And I just want to say to the panel, to Peter, thank you so much for joining us today. It's such a, a pleasure to hear your thoughts, ideas. Um, I think it's inspiring and it's also it, it widens our our discussions this week to think about the broader context we exist within. And that's so important in the world we are in today. And Alec, it's always a delight. Alex, a, a keyboard member and also an individual who's had a wealth of experience both within this movement, but also thinking about a European context, a political context as well. So I thank you for that to Alec. So if you are interested in, in Peter's book, I think there's a link <laughs> in, the, in the chat. And I just want to say all to the audience, thank you so much for your questions. It's been really fruitful, this discussion. I have also want to put on record thanks to Alison and Victoria, who you didn't see behind the scenes, but who have been helping us and Mary as well to make this uh, this session work as well as we had hoped for and boy has it worked really well um so thanks to them too and all the volunteers who are volunteering at the moment to make our summit happen it's down to you that this works and we're just truly truly grateful 
for you using your free time and your voluntary voluntary efforts to make this such a success. So there's a few more sessions after this, I think, um, later on. And I hope you all have an amazing, some of you is morning, some of you is later evening. For me, it's coming into the evening time. So thank you so much. And again, thank you to Peter and Alec.